No, this chapter is titled Matter and Energy. We're done talking about the matter, now we're going to talk about energy. So energy is a major component of our universe. There is matter and there is energy. Um, they are not the same thing. Energy can be defined as the capacity to do work. And um, the way we use the terms energy and work in science are a little different than how we use them in everyday life. They're kind of related to each other, but um, they're not exactly the same. So work is defined as the result of a force acting on a distance. So if I push this stapler across the bench, this is a force acting across a distance. I've pushed the stapler from one side of the bench to the other. I did work. You gonna find anybody that's gonna pay you to do that? Probably not. That's how we use work in everyday life. Well, it's something I do that someone pays me for. You can get paid to sit and think about stuff. There are jobs like that. Is that work in terms of science work? A force acting on a distance? No, that's not work. So energy is the capacity to do work. It's the ability to exert a force across a distance. The behavior of matter is driven by energy, and that's why we need to talk about energy. To understand what matter does, we have to understand a little bit about energy because energy is what causes matter to do what it does. So just like there's conservation of mass or matter, there's also conservation of energy. The law of conservation of energy states that energy is neither created nor destroyed. All the energy that there is in the universe is all the energy that there ever will be in the universe. It can't be created or destroyed. So we say it's conserved. You can't create energy out of nothing. It also doesn't vanish or disappear into nothing. You can transform it from one form into another and some forms of energy are a lot more useful than other forms of energy. But you can't destroy it. So different types of energy or different forms of energy. Kinetic energy. This is the energy associated with motion. The trains that roll by here on a regular basis. They're moving, right? They have a lot of kinetic energy because they're moving. Potential energy <coughs> is energy associated either with position or composition. Here we're on the second floor. And if you took a water balloon and held it out over the, the balcony over there, that would have potential energy. Because what would happen if you let go of it? It would fall and break open when it hit the sidewalk. I don't recommend doing that. Um, electrical energy is energy associated with the flow of electrical charge. We're using electrical energy to generate light in the room, to run the, the electronics for the computer and all of that stuff. Thermal energy is um, energy associated with the random motions of adder, adder. <laughs> atoms and molecules in the matter. So we talked about solids and how in the solid state the particles are moving. They're just like vibrating and oscillating, right? just like you guys are moving a little bit. That is what thermal energy is. When you increase the temperature of a substance, the, the molecules become more agitated, they move more. So it's like the student's getting really, really antsy because I forgot to take a break or something and you're just like jiggling and fidgeting and maybe somebody has to go to the bathroom, right? And you're just wiggling, right? That's an increase in thermal energy. It's a type of uh, kinetic energy. Uh, chemical energy is a type of uh, potential energy. It's due to the composition of the substance and it has to do with the positions of the particles. So gasoline, we understand, we can use, we can burn it in a controlled way to power our vehicles or it can cause a big explosion in an uncontrolled reaction. There's a lot of chemical energy stored in gasoline. And that has to do with the relationships between the carbon and the hydrogen atoms in the molecules. So 
all different types of energy fall into either kinetic energy or potential energy. And the total energy of a substance is the sum of its potential and kinetic energy. So if we think about water in a reservoir, um, there's this dam holding back the water. The water over here has high potential energy because if the dam were to break or if you opened the floodgates and released more water, what would this water do? It would pour out and go down the river. Does flowing water have power? Can it do work? Can it move things? Yeah, it can just shove houses off their foundations. It can be incredibly destructive. It has a great deal of energy, the capacity to do work. We can also control it and use it to turn turbines and change that kinetic energy into electrical energy. When the water is released from its high potential energy situation to a low potential energy, um, the energy doesn't disappear, it gets transformed into kinetic energy, the energy of motion. The water is moving down the river. Well, if we have energy, maybe I should stop and ask, does anybody have questions about that? Another example um, would be if, if you take my marker again, and when I hold it out above the floor, it has potential energy. Because if I let go of it, as we demonstrated the law of gravity yesterday, it will fall to the floor. Right now, it's not moving very much. It has very little kinetic energy. When I let go of it, what happens to its movement? It begins to move faster and faster as it gets closer to the floor. As it's going down, its kinetic energy is increasing, its potential energy is decreasing. Then the big question is, what happened to the energy now that it's sitting on the floor? Where did that kinetic energy go? We can't really observe it with our senses. It goes into thermal energy. When it collides with the floor, that kinetic energy is dissipated as thermal energy. But it's so small that we can't, you know, it doesn't feel hot when you pick it up. Well, we have to be able to measure energy, so of course we need units. So um, the SI unit of energy is the joule. That's a lowercase j. This font is, is a bit odd. This is the joule. The abbreviation for it is a capital J. Um, another commonly used unit of energy is the calorie probably familiar with calories, right? So a calorie is the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. That's how it's defined. The abbreviation for calorie is lowercase c-a-l. The calorie that we're familiar with is the nutritional calorie. It's actually a kilocalorie. It's a thousand of these regular calories with the lowercase c. So this is calorie with a capital C, and the abbreviation is capital C-A-L, and this lowercase c calorie is smaller. So it's kind of nice, but it's also kind of confusing. I didn't make it up, so um, it's not my fault. But a, a nutritional calorie is actually a thousand scientific calories, or one kilocalorie. Another unit of energy, uh, the one that PG&E uses, is a kilowatt hour. Um, we won't do much with kilowatt hours. Here's a table from your textbook giving the relationship between some of these units. One calorie is equal to 4.184 joules. Uh, you don't have to memorize that. I'd give it to you. Um, one calorie with a capital C is equal to 1,000 calories with a lowercase c. I will not try to trick you with that on an exam. Homework worksheets, all bets are off. But on an exam, I won't try to trick you with that. And I definitely wouldn't ask you to know this one, a kilowatt hour, to joules. But if, I, if you needed to convert um, joules to kilojoules, or kilocalories, not that one, kilocalories to regular calories, I would expect you to do that because that's just using metric prefixes. Okay. So the complete combustion 
of a small wooden mat produces approximately 512 calories of heat, how many kilojoules are produced? Well, this ends up being a unit conversion process problem or dimensional analysis. So anytime you have a problem and you're not sure how to approach it, try dimensional analysis. It works much of the time in, in chemistry. So we read the problem. We need to write down the numbers. I'm given 512 calories of heat. That's the only number in there. What is it asking me to find? Kilojoules. So I'm going to put kilojoules over here. So I know where I'm starting, and I know where I'm trying to get. Now I have to figure out how to get there. Well, a good place to start might be looking at this table. Well, we don't see a relationship between uh, calories and kilojoules. But we see something related, a calorie and a joule. So one calorie is 4.184 joules. Well, so maybe we should write that down. One calorie equals 4.184 joules. So then we look at where we are here. We've got calories and kilojoules, and now we've got this. Well, with this, we could get from calorie to joule, couldn't we? So we could go from calorie to joule, and then can we make this leap from joule to kilojoule? Sure, all we need to know is what kilo means. <coughs> so we can do this in two steps. So 512 calories, two arrows, two fractions. Units in the path are calories to joules to kilojoules, so those are the units that go on the top of all these fractions, calories to joules to kilojoules. And I get rid of the extra units by dividing. I take calorie, I divide by calorie. Joule, I divide by tool. Get all the units worked out first. The units then tell me where to put the numbers. I don't have to think about it. So this one has the same units as this relationship. So one calorie, I'll put one in front of calorie, 4.184 with joule, 4.184. What's on the top is equal to what's on the bottom of their fraction. That's what has to happen for a, a unit conversion, a unit factor. And then this one, I've got joule and joule, and I've got kilo. So kilos on the top. On the bottom, on the other side of the line, I write what kilo means. Kilo means 10 to the 3. So 10 to the 3 down there. 1 kilojoule is 1 times 10 to the 3rd joules. It's a very nice pattern. You learn the pattern. You don't have to think about it. It's awesome to be able to think about it, but it's pretty cool not to have to. So then we get out the calculator. Uh, 512 times 4.184 divided by 1 EE3 equals. Um, this has three sig figs. This relationship is not exact, but this one is. This has four sig figs, three sig figs. Three is smaller, so my answer should have three. So 2.14, I'm going to write down two extras. The unit that's left is kilojoules, and so we'd round that to 2.14 kilojoules. Anybody else get that? Phew. It's getting a little insecure there. Any questions? So same process as what we learned in Chapter 2, just a, a different unit. The kilo part is exactly the same, and that's one of the beauties of the metric system is you've got this one set of relationships, and you can apply it to any unit.